far, everyone has eventually report, uh, responded to my email. Uh, I have a couple emails from people here that I haven't replied to. All right, so um, first and first announcement, tomorrow is election day and the faculty senate uh, apparently passed um, uh, a law, a rule saying that uh, missing class to vote is an excuse absence. So um, that means you can miss this class to vote. Uh, they didn't, unfortunately, they didn't pass a law saying I could cancel class. Uh, so I'm gonna be here tomorrow <clears throat> at 7:30, but I will, I will, I promise now to not talk about anything new. Um, I will review all stuff. I will do more examples of the stuff we've already seen. And you'll have the recording anyway. So go vote if you haven't done it yet. Um, okay. So um, the, the mean value theorem, which I haven't told you what it is yet. I'm still not going to tell you. Instead, I'm going to ask you a question. So be ready. Um, so there's a lot of ways um, you can get fined for speeding. Um, and especially, especially in Spain, the U.S., it seems to me like it's a lot harder to get fined for speeding. Uh, it seems like you need. It seems like in the U.S., you generally need a a police car to be hiding in a bush to, and then you got pulled over. But in Spain, there's just radars everywhere. Um, like the police officers never leave their, their houses to find you. It's very efficient. Um, so um, suppose uh, I'm driving and a camera takes a picture of me at say 12, um, then uh, a mile away, the camera takes a picture of me at 12.01. <laughs> um, this was on a uh, 50 miles per hour zone. So I received uh, a ticket at home claiming that I was driving at 60 miles per hour. Again, I and I claim that um, Never, ever. <clears throat> so, so you're driving on a 50 mile per hour zone, which, um, well, you shouldn't do this, but uh, for the sake of the problem, say you, you did, and you're, you're seen, um, you're seen driving you're seeing at the beginning of a mile and at the end of a mile and one minute has passed between those. So that would make, that would mean that the instantaneous speed, um, that would mean that your, your average speed was one mile a minute, which uh, is the same as 60 miles per hour. So, um, so that's the question. Um, is there a way to for you to um, to drive one mile in one minute? The thing is, your speed is not always the same. Never. Um, maybe it's supposed to be constant, but it's never actually exactly constant. So, can you travel a mile in a minute without ever hitting exactly sixty miles per hour? That's the question. Um, so, um, 
So what's the answer? Um, why don't why doesn't everyone tell me? Ooh. There's um, eight people voted. So could you be, I don't know, trying to think of how it could happen, how we would tell it to the judge. Uh, I want the answer to be no, so I don't have to pay the fine. Oh, well, uh, I think that's it. That's, um, two people didn't vote. You have five seconds to vote. All right. Um, well, that was a landslide. So, um, does anyone want to defend their position? Um. So if the average speed was 60 miles per hour, then at some point, the instantaneous speed has, is, has to be 60 miles per hour because because your average is just At some point, you had to cross from more, from no, you had to cross from less than sixty miles per hour to more than sixty miles per hour. Even if at some point your instantaneous um um speed or velocity is less or more than sixty miles per hour, at some point you had to cross sixty miles per hour. So, I agree, and um, I also agree. It's hard to put into words why. Um, but anyway, um, the people who said yes, um, you are correct. Um, you, if your if your average speed is sixty miles per hour, at some point, in the at some point, your uh, your your instantaneous speed had to be sixty miles per hour. So the answer is no. And that is that is the content of the mean value theorem. That's all it is. Um, of course, it says something about a function, not necessarily me driving. But let me, uh, before I say, let me draw a picture. So if I have, if I draw a graph of my position, um, so if I do um, my position over time, So here is a zero minutes. Here is one minute. And what I'm saying is I start at zero miles and I end at one mile. And somehow I get from, from one point to the other. So the thing is, um, I could have been going well, I could have been going in a straight line at a constant speed, but I could have, um, so I'm not, I'm not saying this is not, this is my my position over time. So a straight line would be going at a constant velocity, uh, but I'm probably not. So I'm going uh, in the, the, the position over time looks like some curve now. Um, this um so the the gain the change in the y coordinate is the is the distance traveled uh, 
and the change in the x coordinate is the time traveled, and you already know know this uh, time passed. You already know this. The the slope of that line is the average rate of change, which is the average speed. The slope So the question would be, um, is there necessarily, so necessarily meaning no matter what graph I draw, is there necessarily a point on the graph whose um, slope is equals the slope of the of the red line. Or equivalently, where the tangent line is, if, if two lines have the same slope, they're parallel. The tangent line is parallel to the red line. Because again, two lines with the same slope are parallel. So um, the answer the answer is, yeah, there, uh, for, in this case, there's more than one. It doesn't have to be more than one. But for example, at this point, probably the, the tangent line is parallel, and that's what that's what I'm saying exists. Oh, now they're just like writing and getting deleted. Canyon line. Why? I see the line getting drawn; and it disappears. So in a graph, what I'm saying is, if if between po two points of the graph I have a certain line joining them, I know in between there's a tangent line that's parallel to that line, and it feels. I feel like on the picture it's pretty convincing because if I think of um, taking taking the this red line and I start moving it, like clearly the original red line is not tangent, but I start moving it, there's going to be a point. There's going to be a point where it's going to be far away. It's going to be a point where it crosses, and there's going to be a point in the middle where it's tangent. And this intuition turns out to work. Um, that's the content of the mean value theorem. <clears throat> Are there any questions? Okay, so um, what does the mean value theorem say literally? Um, if I have a function which is uh, continuous on a closed interval and differential, so just like Wall's theorem from Friday. On uh, A B. So for Rolle's theorem, here's Rolle's theorem. Let me remind you. <clears throat> for Rolle's theorem, I had a function which is continuous on a closed interval, differentiable on the inside, and then the the values were equal at the endpoint. So I was saying, if this happens, then there's a horizontal tangent. So now I'm saying, I don't know anything about the values, but I know something about a tangent in the middle. Um, then there is a uh, point C in AB such that F prime of C is the average uh, rate of change 
between A and B, and then has a formula. Um, there's a formula for the average rate of change. Um, that's the change in Y. So the change in Y is F of B minus F of A divided by the change in X. So that's what the, uh, that's what the mean value theorem says. Um, if you think if the function was the, the distance traveled by me um, on this day that I got a fine, then uh, it would be, um, the denominator here would be, it would be one minute, which is the total um, time that passed between B, which is the final moment, and A, which is the starting moment, and the distance traveled. So F, the function, would be the distance traveled. So this would be one mile. And this would be saying that F prime at some moment is one mile per minute, which is 60 miles per hour. <clears throat> okay. Um, so um, if the function, so in the graph, it's what I just drew. So if this is A and this is B and this is F of A and this is F of B, this line has slope equals to the change in y minus the change in x divided by, uh, sorry, the change in y divided by the change in x. And what I'm saying is that any function that goes between these two has a point C where the tangent line is parallel. Well. Wait, um, so, um, are there any questions on what the theorem says? It's kind of, I don't know why it's called the mean value theorem, just to confuse us with the intermediate value theorem. It should be called uh, the average rate of change theorem. But uh, no, they decide to call it the mean value theorem. <clears throat> so this, I mean, I believe that this is a confusing statement, um, especially because of that f of a minus f of this that formula, which looks kind of complicated. But what you gotta think is that if the slope, uh, the average slope between a and b, so. Um, this is so. This is a lot to do with Rolle's theorem because um, if if f of a would equal f of b, this would mean that f prime of c is f of b minus f of a, which is now zero. If, if there are, if there are, if I'm subtracting two equal things. This would tell me that there's a point in there with horizontal slope, which is Rolle's theorem from Friday. Rolle's theorem says um, if f of a is f of b, then there's a point in there with horizontal slope. But this is this works for any function. <clears throat> well, I mean, it tells you a different thing. 
so in a graph, um, if you, well, feel free to look, think a bit about my formulas, think if they make sense, but uh, I'm trying to look at the graph here, not so much at the formulas. In a, so I'm saying here's, well, so for this example that I drew here, this is the point a f of a this is the point b f of b this necessarily then s slope the change in y divided by the change in x and here so in in this example this is going to be c the derivative equals this same slope. Um, and you can tell that those two slopes are equal because this line, the tangent line, and the line joining those two points are parallel. So maybe if my picture is not very good, the, the computer uh, it's more convincing. So um, the way, so let me, I, I'm not, I don't want to prove it, but so if you, you can change the function and you can see that there's always a point in there where those two lines are parallel and, and this one is tangent. <laughs> so um, the, the way this is proved is not very hard. Um, it's just, I don't want to spend 20 minutes on this. The way this is proved is by taking your, uh, taking your function and adding to it a linear function. So something like this, a times x, until uh, this becomes Rolle's theorem. And then you might notice that the point, the, the special point where the tangent is parallel to the secant doesn't change. Um, and you can do that algebraically, it's not very hard, but also I don't, I don't think it's worth doing it right now. Okay. Are there any questions? I feel like there should be, this is complicated. So wouldn't that just, so I'm, okay. So the secant line being parallel wouldn't that just be the tangent line just at like different point? Yeah, what you're, what the theorem is telling you is that there is a point. Um, it's telling you somewhere, you know, if you if you draw a graph, some of the you know, you have you have your your secant line. Some of the tangent lines are parallel. Some are not. The theorem is telling you at least one of them is exactly parallel. But uh, well, I'm confused. Okay, so if you, you find the tangent line, mm -hmm. um, and one of the secant lines is like parallel to the tangent line. Mm -hmm. Would that mean that they're like that? Secant line that's parallel could also be a tangent, the tangent line, but at another point, or is that just it's still considered a secant line because it's still like approaching, it's still like one of those lines that just keep approaching, that keeps approaching a lot of the tangent line to make the tangent line. Uh, so the secant line, it could be tangent somewhere else. Like it could, it could not be. Um, so nothing. There's nothing really to say about about the second line. Nothing really to say about this line, except it's there. The slope is is the average rate of change. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Um, yeah, and I'm just I'm just kind of confused if it's like purpose because like it's all well, the purpose that, like, that that is um confusing because 
what do you do with the information that there is a point? Because if it says there is a point, for example, it's between zero and one, you don't know anything about the point from this theorem. So what what's the point of saying, I know the derivative somewhere is 0 0.7, and I'm not telling you where. It's It seems like there's no purpose to this. Um, like, what do you do with this? Um, that is that is a good question, which I haven't answered. Okay. Um, so, uh, so, mm. so let's answer that question. So it's it's like Rolle's theorem. In Rolle's theorem, Rolle's theorem says if something happens, then I know somewhere the tangent is horizontal. That's pretty pointless. But if you happen to know that the tangent is never horizontal, if you if you know if something happens, then another thing happens. Uh, then if you know if it's election day, then you can skip class. If you can skip class, then it must not it must not be election day. So, if the tangent is never horizontal, uh, that means that the function is never is never equal at two different points. And similarly for the mean value theorem, if the tangent if the slope doesn't have a particular value, that means I know something about the function. So, um. This is how you use a mean value theorem. It's kind of a, uh, so it's kind of a theoretical thing. Um, you use it to learn more practical things about functions. Um, so mean value theorem tells us something about the derivative at uh, Mysterious. That's how I spell mysterious. Um, mysterious point. Um, but we use it to um, conclude that we know things about the original function given something about its uh, derivative. So for example, um, so for example, say I have that I have a differentiable function and say I know that f of zero, for, so for example, this could be the movement of a car. f of zero is phi, and I know that the derivative is always uh, smaller than two, because this is, um, this is a car that's driving the speed limit. <clears throat> so th this is something, this is something that we recently be a practical problem where I know the the value of a function at one point, and then I know a range in which the derivative can move. Um, so, can uh, f of three can f of three equal twenty? So, the answer uh, the answer is no, and the the reason is the mean value theorem. which um, I'm going to get tired of writing. So I'm going to go call it MBT, <clears throat> most valuable theorem. Um, 
the mean value theorem. So if if f of three was twenty, then the mean value theorem would say what would it say? So the mean value theorem says if you have um, if you have two points and you know these uh, the values that the there's a point in the in the middle where the derivative is the average rate of change. So um, what does it say in this situation? Uh, I mean, I guess since um, they're parallel in this case, uh, if you try to input three, then since it didn't work for like a derivative, then it wouldn't work for the original. Um, not sure what you mean there. So the mean value theorem says you have a function which is continuous and differentiable, like here's the case. And what the, so the part where it tells me something is if this happens, it says there is a point C in between those two where the derivative is the average rate of change. And I don't have to think, I, I know the formula. The theorem tells me what formula it is. So the mean value theorem, so let me write it down again. The mean value theorem says there is a C in in the in the interior of the interval such that um, the derivative there is the average rate of change, which has this formula. So this is what the man, mean value theorem buys us. So if f of zero is five and f of three is 20, this means that um, uh, f prime of c is 20 minus five divided by Three minus zero, which is fifteen, divided by three, which is five. So what this is telling us is that there is a point in in this case. Uh, there's a point in between where the derivative is five. But that doesn't that doesn't make sense. That doesn't agree with what I know about the function. Um, because I was told that the derivative is always at most uh, two. So if I said, I'm saying if f of three um, is 20, then I get nonsense. That means that f of three cannot be 20. Um, right, if I say, um, if this apartment was on fire, then I would be feeling hot and I wouldn't be teaching this class. That means the apartment must not be on fire. So if f of three is 20, the mean value theorem tells me there's a point. It doesn't tell me anything about the points, which is a bit strange. Uh, but it says it says somewhere in there the derivative has got to be this formula, which spits out five. If I know that the speed never goes past two, then it cannot be five. So I cannot reach 20. And this is how you use the mean value theorem. So 
what questions do you have? Okay, so then I'm gonna have more questions. Wait, so mm -hmm. since you proved that the um, slope of that like secant line is like different than what we expect x to be in the derivative of um, of that function. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm confused. So like I I'm, I'm confused. So yeah. what I said was um so maybe maybe if I draw a picture. Mm -hmm. I said if f of zero is three. So um f of zero is three. Three six nine twelve fifteen. 15. So no f of zero is five. <clears throat> I really said if zero was no zero is five. Um f of zero is five. And f of three is twenty. What I'm saying is there's no way the graphs go through these two points if uh if the slope is smaller than two all the time. So slope smaller than two um, means in, in this scale that I drew, it means that this is the biggest slope it, it can have. So this is the biggest the slope can be. So, how could if you if you can only go if your incline can only be what the red line is is showing? How can you get from from one blue point to the other? You can't. So then, those those wouldn't be valid points in the function. There's then. I lied to you. If, if someone tells you that the function goes through those two points, uh, they're lying, basically. Can't, can't be, it's not possible. So it's just kind of like, if you have like a function and you just purposely say that one point equals another. So like you see, like if you have like a function, if you were to say like f3 is equal to five, but in the actual function, that wouldn't be the case, then this is like similar to that situation where you're saying like f of three equals five, but that doesn't, that doesn't actually work out in the function. Yeah, I guess. Um, so, okay. Um, I can do another example, but honestly, they're all, they're all pretty similar. So say, okay, another example. If, so if f of one is uh, three and negative two, the derivative is between negative two and two, How big can f of three be? Let's say f of two. So this is saying. So what this is saying in a if if this was a, a moving object. Um, If 
at t equals one second, you are three. Um, three miles away, well, let's say one minute. And your speed is the most two miles per minute. How far Can you be after um, two minutes? So if one minute passes and you can only go two miles per minute, how how further can you have gone? That's the that's what we're answering here. So um, at one minute, you are three miles away. That's saying that f of f of one equals three. Then um, if your speed is at most two miles per minute, I guess forward or backward, that uh, that's the same as saying that the derivative is at most two or negative two. And then I'm asking one minute later at two minutes, uh, how far can you be? So, so what I wrote in formulas is the same as what I wrote in a sentence. I'm almost five miles away. Right, that's that's the answer. Um, and I think intuitively you, you know this and how close can you be? So that's, that's how far you can get if you're moving away, but if you're coming closer, how, how far can you be? How do we know it's five miles? I'm confused. We know it's five miles because you're three miles away. One minute passes. You can only move two miles a minute. So in that minute, you could have only moved two miles. Oh, OK. So um, so if, if instead, so that's what happens if you're three miles away and you're going away. What happens if you're coming, if you're, if you're going towards the origin? How close can you get? if you can only move two miles a minute at most. One mile away. You're, you're three miles away. You're three miles away. The, the biggest distance you can move at two miles a, a minute is come back two miles. So, this is so what you did really is apply the mean value theorem so let me tell you how we apply it how we just apply the mean value theorem um f of one is three f uh, blah, blah, blah. the derivative is between negative two and two and the question is what happens to f of two so what i'm saying is if f of two was bigger than five, I'm gonna, I need to reach something that doesn't make sense. Then what I would have is that f of two, the average speed, so what would be the average speed? It would be bigger than five minus three divided by one. If, if I'm more than five miles away, that means that in one minute, I moved more than two miles. So what this is, this formula is saying is, if I'm five miles away in one minute, I traveled 
more than uh, two miles. That's always formula is saying. Uh, the mean value theorem says, uh, since the function is differentiable, it says that there is a C Uh, such that the derivative there uh, is the average speed, which is bigger than two. Um, so what I'm saying is that if the average velocity was more than two, instantaneous velocity at some points must have been bigger than two, but that makes no sense because I was sold that the derivative was a most two. And this is a contradiction. This is a nonsense. So I can't have traveled more than five, five miles, which is what you already told you. Uh, you're, you already told me. You told yourself as well. And for the same reason, this is now going to be exactly the same. If f of two was less than one, then This would be smaller than one minus three divided by one, which is now negative two. So by the mean value theorem, again, for some C, F prime of C would be equal to this quantity, which is negative two, which is mo smaller than negative two, which is another contradiction. <clears throat> and that's how you apply the mean value theorem. Um, do you have any questions? It's a rhetorical question. I know you have questions. I'm just asking you to say them out loud. Okay, uh, well, I have, one, I have less than a minute, so that's gonna be it. Um, all right, tomorrow I'll do examples of things. I won't do anything new. On Wednesday, I'll show exciting conclusions of the mean value theorem. All right, well, my office hours are.